welcome to Brutal Planet Magazine. Yes. <laughs> also known as Wednesday 13. Welcome to Brutal Planet Magazine. Welcome to Brutal Planet Magazine. This is all from a video. Welcome to Brutal Planet Magazine. You're listening to Brutal Planet Hey, what's up, everybody? It's CJ Pierce here from Drana Pool, and you're listening to Brutal Planet Media right here. Get yourself. Hey, I'm Steve from Within the Ruins, and this is Brutal Planet. Greetings, Brutal Planet. We're live with Mr. Charlie Parra del Riego. Is that how you say it? That's how you say it, man. You do nailed it. Actually, this is really surprising. So thanks for nailing it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I'm a, I'm actually in the LA area, so there's obviously a lot of Latin influence here. So you know, I do my best. Oh, you you nailed it, man. I, actually, like most people think that I'm from San Diego when they ask me <laughs> where I'm from, and I used to correct them one once in a while. I would say, No, I'm not from San Diego. I'm from Peru. That's way more in the <laughs> south. Yeah. But, you know, I started to get tired of it. Now, everyone that tells me, hey, you're from San Diego. I said, yeah, man, born and raised in Sandy. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah, people think I'm a surfer. I don't know why. <laughs> well, it's funny. I had a I had a conversation with a South American person a while back, and they're like, it, they made such a great point. They're like, hey, I'm American, too. And I was like, wow, that's it. They're like, I'm like, I'm American. And they're like, well, we're American, too. We're just South American. I'm like, oh, that's a damn good point. I mean, it, it's the fact that everybody says, like, welcome to America, right? Yeah. They say, welcome to America, like Rocky, he's American, right? And mm -hmm. hero. But um, in the end, it's like North America, South America, Central America. So it's like yeah. the whole thing, right? There's a whole continent here. We're so, <laughs> we're so, uh, we're so myopic here in the, in the United States. We're like, ah, this is America. <laughs> Oh, it's like it's kind of America here too, you know, way more south. <laughs> yeah. Are you in Peru right now? Yeah, that, there's where I live. I live in Lima, and um, awesome. but I, I actually go to the states pretty pretty often for several reasons, you know, in, including like, of course, mostly because of music. Sure. Well, so, I mean, Latin America in general has a huge metal contingency too. I mean. I, I don't know if there's anywhere else in the world where metal is as huge as it is in Latin America. I mean, there are several like festivals, like big, big festivals. The latest that I I, I had a chance to to perform at was in Rock al Parque. That's Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, that's um that's a huge festival actually. The last time that I was there, uh, I play with a with a band from Spain that is called uh, Saratoga, and mm -hmm. we got to play with. For example, it's like a power metal band, right? But in this mm -hmm. festival, you get to watch uh, Agnostic Front. There was Overkill was there too. We were at the same hotel, really nice people. Like Vinny Stigma, dude, what a great guy. What a great guy. Legend. Wow. Legend. So yeah, it's, oh, it's pretty big because it's, it's packed. It's like 150,000 people per night. And it's like three nights in a row. So Jeez. it's good. I know. It's good. I just see the footage of like Maiden at like Rock and Rio and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, that looks so amazing. I mean, that's the reason why they really is like, is it let we should do like a video about this. We should do like, a yeah. Video. And it, that's pretty much what, what Megadeth did in Argentina. So mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's pretty much like crowds. It, it depends on the country, you know, but yeah, I, I believe that at least in my experience, when I played in Colombia, that was probably one of the biggest crowds that I've ever been playing for. Well, props to Latin America for being badass metal fans because nice. <laughs> so I want to ask you, man, like you, we, I'm pretty new to the YouTube thing, but kind of tell your origin story because you kind of got started in this format. You were, you've been doing it way longer than most people. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I actually started playing in bands way before YouTube, right? I used to play in yeah. bars, used to play like, you know, do like really small tours but local tours right mm -hmm. i did not even speak english back then like not like this so um i knew like the basic words right so a uh, thing is that um i started doing some music like instrumental stuff and i did not know where to upload it and there was like myspace and I there remember. was youtube 
and I decided to upload it on YouTube because quality looked great. And it's like I started uploading there and only my friends would watch my videos because it was for my friends, right? So they would like be comments like, dude, uh, you look terrible, comb your hair or stuff like that. <laughs> and But then videos started getting like, all right, my 35 friends would watch the video. So there was like 35 views, right? But then the views started to go like a thousand, 5,000, 10,000 till one of those videos reached like 1 million views. And they said, oh my God, this, this is kind of a window uh, for my work, right? And I'm talking about 2009, something like that. Long, yeah. long time ago. And uh, seeing- oh, That's almost 20 years ago now. Yeah. And, and seeing 15. comments, comments in, in different languages, that was crazy. So I said, at, at the time I was performing in bars that was it that was only in bars and uh then i kind of made a community out of it i i had no idea like th back then there was not not a term like youtuber that that term did not exist and mm -hmm. i think that nobody actually had any idea of what likes and subscribers and views would mean in the future right and that pretty much got me like in, into places that i never thought i would be and I'm talking about that like 15 years ago and mm -hmm. now it's like 2024 and I'm still surprised how, you know, social media works. It's, it's really amazing. It's kind of almost, I feel like it's overtaken the mainstream kind of media, especially in the news format. You know, I'm a big like politics junkie and I follow mm -hmm. people on like Twitter and, and TikTok and stuff like that. And you get, the the news you get from Twitter is like three months before it hits like the New York Times. You know, it's crazy. Oh, absolutely. There's like a lot of news that do not appear in Peruvian TV or South American TV. But you get on Twitter and you're going to find the information there. Man. There's a lot of misinformation, too. Right. Yeah. But you, you definitely get to to find what's going on faster in Twitter then on TV or even radio. So it's crazy. Yeah. So you were, you were part of the future before it was the future. Really? I mean, oh, um, I, I think that I never saw it that way at, back in the day, but it's because back in the day, I would never thought that I would be able to go on tour, like a tour, like outside of my country. Right. Yeah. And um, that's been crazy because after uh, like, um, once I performed in Colombia in this festival called uh, Altavoz that was in Medellin and it was a festival like for 30,000 people or something like that. It was a big festival. I think is one of the guys in Gibson was in the audience, like one of the executives. And he actually reached out to me and told me that he wanted to work with me. I was shocked because I really like Gibson guitars. Thing is that back in the day, uh, he asked me, what my international tour dates were and i did did not have any it was just like a, a one thing happened mm -hmm. it was like they invited my band to this festival and we don't have any international tour dates we play locally so he said right we, we cannot sign you or endorse you right now but let's keep in touch and one year later i re released uh, this video called punk versus metal that now has like 10 million views I've seen and it. That, I watched it. Oh, nice. Nice. Thanks. And the thing is that with this video, like a lot of things started to happen because first I got a call from Gibson. Then I got a call from EMG back in the day from Dean Markley strings. It was crazy because it was something that at least in this audience and at least in this market back in the day, that was impossible. It was like, what? Like a guy from our country yeah. is like in that roster. That was crazy. So it, it, it was like like you guys say it was bonkers man like people went, people went crazy when you saw that and yeah man that that's how we actually basically how it started so you, you played with a lot of like major touring bands like cobra and the lotus and stuff like that T talk about kind of the doors that the youtube thing opened for you did did that i mean you just mentioned the gibson thing like did people start contacting you because of your videos or how did you make that jump from from the youtube world into like a you know, international touring. Uh, thing is that I used to record most of my live shows, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, because I wanted to watch them to see where I was screwing up 
guitar solos or, or guitar parts. But yep. then I said, what if I upload this too? What if I share this too, like live videos, performing live? And um, that, get, that gave me a chance to join several bands without an, an, an audition. Like covering the Lotus was a thing from 2012 and 2014. Um, and they basically just sent me a plane ticket and told me to join the band. I was like, dude, do I have to do an audition? Or no, no, no. We just watch the videos. We we know like it's real. And um that's, that's how it amazing. started there. I know. I mean, it's not that uh, Corner Lotus was probably, you know, one of my worst experiences ever. <laughs> but, but it was it was great, it, it was a great learning process there. Um, because that hooked me up with other people, with the Dino Caceres, for example. For some weird yeah, yeah. reason that I don't know, Cobra and the Lotus was opening for Fear Factory. That was a weird mix. Uh, but you know that Dino has like a, a Latino heritage, right? And, uh, we love Dino. We're big Dino fans here. Oh, man. I, I love him. It's <laughs> like He always calls me, you know, amigo all the time. So um, that's the thing that we started like being friends because we were kind of the Latinos of the bunch of the tour, right? And we started hanging out and, you know, I, I, I was a big Dino Casters fan, big Fear Factory fan way, way uh, before yeah. that started, before that tour started. So that was great, man. That was great. I still talk to Dino. We, we have actually released a, a song together. So it's, it's good times, man good times he he's been he's been on with us a couple times and he always he always brings some controversy which i love and he's always great to talk to oh man do you know do you know rules i think that um people do not have you know people are not aware that actually dino brought a lot of the modern metal standards oh he's yeah right he's hand, an OG. You know, yeah he's an og like the the open string riffs you know those melodic bits that that he always makes it, it's great he's like a, a really like a modern day guitar hero man absolutely totally. absolutely it, we had this conversation with him too about mm -hmm. uh electronica because fear factory is also one of the first like heavy heavy metal bands to mix electronica into it and uh he kind of talked about how they they got started playing at backyard parties in la and he wrote riffs to like the dj playing edm beats and stuff i'm just like that is I mean, Dino has this thing that he's a pioneer in several ways. I, I remember that on the, in that tour with Cover the Lotus, um, we were using Black Star amps, but like the whole thing, stocks, like the head, and it was, you know, it was pretty much a mess when we we're like loading in and setting up everything on stage. And one day Dino tells me, why don't you just go digital? Why don't you just, you know, plug, you know, straight to the PA and rock out? said, how do I do that? And that was in year 2013. So um, I went full digital and, you know, I was the one like bringing my digital paddle board and the other dude in the band was like, you know, carrying stacks and, you know, and amps and everything, you know, Dino actually was pretty big, big influence in going digital. And now everybody's like, kind of like doing it. The first person yeah. I ever saw doing that was Dino. For That's sure. amazing. We had this conversation about this the other night because it's I likened it to like DJs, right? Like back in the mm -hmm. day, you had to carry your record crates around and turntables, and then it became kind of digital. And people hate, will hate on DJs who use digital equipment, but it's like it's just new equipment. It's a new so same thing with guitars. It's like if you don't have to carry a you know hundred pound head around and 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 look at why not? Like why not use the digital? It's better, you know. The Technology's there. Yeah, I mean, uh, the last time that I was like in a, the analog way was in a, in a tour in Mexico, like a 12 dates tour. And, you know, in this kind of tours, uh, you already get to rent the backline. We had to rent backline for those shows. And most of the amps were absolutely destroyed. They were all burned out. And, you know, whatever you're using, it's not going to work, right? If, if you go analog but then mm -hmm. i started going digital from that tour on and everything changed for everyone for the better you just go there you plug in and that's it and that's how things are going and and it's even now that truck you know when you go from one country to another or doing overseas tours and you don't have those resources to you know bring that amount of gear to your tour 
going digital is what you're supposed to do. I mean, I, I've all, I've been a support act for several bands here in, in my country for Accept, uh, for Testament, Sepultura, Mr. Big. And um, at least 90% of these guys were carrying digital stuff. You know, you, you wouldn't see an amp on stage. So I think that's the way. And it's been for like probably the last six years or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everyone I talk to uses Kempers now. Yeah, I mean, uh, there now there's so many alternatives. Mm -hmm. For a guy, at least when when we were in the same tour. So let me ask you this: uh, another interesting uh, person that you've worked with, El Depario Siberiano. Oh yeah, awesome How did you drummer. Meet him? He's amazing. He's amazing. Um, he's um, he was playing in Saratoga. In the band from Spain, actually Estepario. Okay. He's uh he's from Spain, so um, thing is that we started. Uh, I used to follow him for like months, probably years, like since he started doing his TikTok stuff. So it was a great experience to actually get to share a stage with him because we did not only were in tour in Mexico like for like twelve days or thirteen. We then made this tour like it was five countries in twelve days. That was so intense. And, you know, it was like in South America. So everything was like super far from from the other country. It's not like the States that you get to drive. Right. This mm -hmm. was all by plane. And the thing is that I can assure you something about Estepario is that all the things that you see on the Internet that he plays with one hand. It's absolutely true. There was there's moments oh, where I believe I, it. I have footage where I'm like playing, you know, the, the hardest guitar solo of that set list. And he's just like having fun, you know, like drinking his water and <laughs> doing this with one hand. It's crazy. And there are guitar solo that he's actually doing the like double kicks and I'm playing guitar and he's like with one hand, like super rise and just with one hand. And, you know, the guy's a sweetheart. He's a really, really down to earth guy. And, um, definitely deserves everything that's happening to him. He's one of the most disciplined guys I've ever met in my life. I learned a lot from him. Props to uh, his name is actually Jorge and I, Jorge. I call him Jorgito. And uh, yeah, he's a great, he's a great guy. I, I, I talked to him once in a it. while. He's a good guy. Yeah. Really awesome. We just, uh, we just used the clip from his channel talking about Slipknot because I don't know if you've been following the drama there, but with uh, Eloy Casagrande, um, there's, it's pretty, pretty well confirmed at this point. I mean, it's not, hasn't been announced, but like, I think he's the new drummer for Slipknot. Like there's so many little proofs and, and, uh, El Stepario had a video about it. Um, because homeboy left Sepultura, like right before their big 40th anniversary, like final tour, you know? Yeah. So I mean, anyway, I like he's, he's someone I follow closely. Yeah. I like the fact that, uh, Stepario has this, like talking about this, you know, things that are going on around, you know, the metal scene and giving the hints. And, you know, I, I love the fact that he's, he's good at telling stuff. He's a good storyteller too. So, yeah. He also said he, that he, he, and this is a quote from him directly. He said, Eloy Grande is the best metal drummer in the world today. He said he's better than Joey Jordison and better than Jay Weinberg. And I was like, wow, coming from a drummer that's as good as him, that's huge. I mean, yeah, because uh, actually his favorite band in the planet is Slipknot, but he loves Aloy. I, I remember talking about that at some point. That's for sure. So what, what are some of the other bands you played with? You played with a lot of big bands you talk about. Um, I've played with, um, well, I, like as a solo artist, I've, I've, I've opened for several acts i've opened for slash uh for judas priest for the cold uh, but lately i've been playing with um besides saratoga i'm i'm playing with uh chris jericho he's got a band that it's okay. called quarantine and we're like a, a band that it's influenced by 80s kiss not the non-makeup era right so mm -hmm. it's like I, I got to behave like some kind of Latino Beanie Vincent during those shows, <laughs> which is pretty far from Saratoga's power metal. 
So I got yeah. to change my mindset, like in a very, you know, abrupt way. Uh, thing is that uh, Chris once wrote me an Instagram message. I, I actually met him like in year 2012 when I was playing with Cobra and the Lotus and he, and he was starting with Fosse. So we were sharing dressing rooms. So it, it's crazy that like 10 years after that encounter, he actually wrote me a message on Instagram, tells me, hey, Charlie, um, what do you think if you play with us at this, this show? Because I was filling in for for the original guitar player, who's Joe McGinnis, an awesome player, awesome, mm -hmm. awesome player, but he couldn't make it to the first show. So I, I go there, we play the show, and Chris actually told me, you got to stay in the band. I want to keep you in the band. And now we're two guitar players there and couldn't be any more grateful because after this happened, I got to share stage with uh, um, Todd Kearns from Slash and the Conspirators, um, with um, Michael Sweet of Striper. That was really awesome. Oh, wow. Um, played with Trickster, with Steve Brown and, and PJ Farley. So, yeah, it's been pretty interesting. It, it's been like, you know, a lot of crazy stuff started to happen from, from there. And I got to share, like, you know, playing the same we I played a show with a uh, quarantine back in Nashville and we got to play with Bruce Kulik, which was oh, really wow. awesome. So yeah, I think that this like uh, Chris Jericho's quarantine thing, it really opened a lot of possibilities, you know, it, it was great. So last year was crazy. I got I got a lot of really crazy gigs because of that. So I'm very grateful for that. I, I, I couldn't be any more grateful with with Chris and the guys. That's so cool. Did you ever in a million years think that just by uploading some videos of you playing guitar to YouTube, you'd end up playing with legends like that? Not at all, to be honest. I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of thoughts about what I do and people think that everything was a plan, you know, that but it was not. I would have never thought that it, that actually I would get to tour outside of my country so very often. Right. And the same happened with Saratoga. It was an, an Instagram message. So I think that that was a great tool because in a million years, I would have imagined that I would have the chance to do all this crazy stuff that's been going on or, or even having like a, a signature guitar and stuff like that. That's amazing. Yeah, it doesn't like looking at your early videos. It, I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's not like you were like, hey, I'm going to do this so people get me in, a, you know, so big touring bands just pick me up. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem like that at all. It just seems like you were uploading videos for fun and people found them and caught on, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I started like hanging out with, uh, I, I did not know what NAM was till I was, till I was called by the Gibson guys and told me we want you to be the first South American with a signature model, which was crazy. Now I had two of them. And the thing is that because of this, I got to meet in person like Jared Dines, um, Cole Rowland. It, it was really good because I got to meet a lot of like people that I really admire. I've, I've done a, a track with Gus G and um, like a versus, like a guitar battle or something with, with Michelangelo Baccio as well. So it's been crazy. Wow. And because of this Gibson thing, I got to meet like several of my heroes. Like uh, I was supposed to play in um, Jim Dunlop, like they, they have this booth, man. And I was supposed to play one of my tracks. Can I swear here? Mm -hmm. All right, there's a track that I, I named Speed Be Fox. Free. And uh, Speed Fox is a track that when kind of, you know, people really started to watch it. It has like 2 million views right now. And um, the thing is that I was supposed to play that song. And the guys at the Dunlop uh, booth, they tell me, hey, there's somebody that, that wants to say hi. And I go backstage and it's Marty Friedman. And it, it was wow. crazy because, you know, he's one of my heroes, right? He's probably everybody's yeah. hero. And he was like such a... Oh, well, he's definitely... He's such a class act. He was like telling me, hey, Charlie, have a great show. And it was like, Marty, watch. And he tells me, hey, I think we both use the same shampoo. Uh, uh, uh. And he left the room. <laughs> And um, yeah, I've got, I've got to meet like some of those those heroes, man. Like Marty, I met Slash. Slash was the Slash was awesome. And um, yeah, it's, are, those are things that I, I actually never thought that would happen. You know, I, I, I've even met Vinnie Vincent in person. I think that he charges for that. 
Por ahí, por ahí. <risa> bueno, and, um, we were at the sound check with actually Chris Jericho and Quarantine, and it was with the bass player. We were checking out, you know, Vinnie Vincent's sound check, which was really like intense. And we, I got to meet him because I, I really like uh, Kiss in general. And I got to meet like pretty much uh, my favorite guitar players in Kiss, like three of them at least. Because I've met Beanie, I've met Bruce, I played with Bruce, and I've met Ace, which was really awesome. It was great. It was like, hey, kid, let's take a selfie. That was great. And um, and yeah, man, it's it's been really awesome. It, it's like things that I never thought it would happen and happen. Besides, like the Chris Jericho thing is as well. I mean, I'm a huge wrestling fan. I really like it since, since I was a kid, and, and being in a band with with Chris. It's like Chris is the guy I, I picked in PlayStation games, so it's crazy. Now we're bandmates. Yeah, it's nuts. It's cool that he was able to make that crossover too, from wrestling to the music. Yeah, I mean he's a rock like, guy. Yeah, Wait. A, yeah, yeah, he's a rock guy. You can tell. I mean that's the reason why um you could easily like he, he did this like in his wrestling gear. He made like Van Halen tributes and stuff like that. So like really into into rock and roll metal. Like he's if, if you ever like get to chat with him and talk about music, man, he's he's like a he's like a Wikipedia of rock and metal. He knows a lot of stuff. It's crazy. I love it. I'm 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 kind of that way too, but I'm I'm more of a nineties kid, so I mean I grew up in the eighties and I love all that stuff, but you know, Metallica, Pantera, Megadeth, Anthrax is more my forte, you know. Right. It's like, we got to be honest here. I'm, I'm from Peru, in South America. So Subaru's stuff got here pretty late. It's like, Kurt Cobain was already dead and people were here still using big hair. It was crazy. It was that like a 10 year oh, wow. gap before the internet, right? But now it's like, at least now everything is like, you know, more like we get to access all the info that it's out there. But yeah, it was so tough back in the day. I mean, now you can like get guitar lessons online. Back in the day, you had to search for them, order them, and it was you know it was pretty much pretty difficult. I think that now that we have access to all that info, is I don't I wouldn't say like it's way easier, but it's more, way more convenient. It's like you you don't have to you know to to suffer about shipping and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Those changed everything. My son plays guitar, and like I, he'll correct me on stuff that I've been playing for years sometimes, and I'm like, "What?" And then he's like, "Well, I have YouTube, right?" It's like he can watch, he play breakdowns on YouTube and slow them down and stuff. And yeah, actually, that's something that do, do you remember those Coliseum videos that were like I'm not sure. Videos? There's like super old guitar videos from the '80s that you know they had like these tutorials, right? Uh -huh. I don't know. Oh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. The, yeah, like the like, VHS ones, like. The... Yes, absolutely. Those ones. Like, do you remember that Jim Gillette vocal tutorial? I think that's, so. That's crazy stuff, dude. You should <laughs> watch that. All that stuff's on YouTube now, which is great. Absolutely everything, everything. And it's crazy because it, it has those video glitches from that era too. So yeah. it's crazy. And now the people actually work. like having those glitches in their videos. And it's like a 2024 video, but let's put some like 80s glitches on it. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy how the how things have kind of evolved too, because it's like I feel like like in the 90s when when I kind of like really got into music. I mean, I grew up listening to like Def Leppard and Molly Crew and all that 80s kind of hair metal, but right. like shredding and being like a fantastic pro player kind of like fell out of style a little bit in the 90s. It became more about like, you know, just guys in t-shirts and just playing some chords and it wasn't I feel like now it's kind of come full circle back to where it's like people respect the craft a lot more and and people that really take their time to you know know their instrument and... yeah i think it's because I, I, there's been some kind of revival about the instrument because actually like right now i'm 39 
So that means that I started like, you know, listening to music and playing guitar when I was like 15 or 14. And at, at the time, pop punk was everywhere and new metal was everywhere. So no guitar solos yeah. were there. Everything was about, you know, nope. the, the chunky riffs and, you know, and the, the, the happy power chords, right? And that the re that's the thing that when I started like listening to music from the 80s, that was like the new thing for me. It was like, wow, this is so crazy. This is like new. But I think that it was because I watched this um, documentary, The Decline of the Western Civilization Part Two, The Metal Years. When I know it well. That was, yeah, that was wild. I, that was Chris wild. Holmes. <laughs> yeah. From Wasp. <laughs> I know. I, I'll never forget that when he's like in that pool, like who like slipping the whole vodka bottle and he says, I'm a happy camper. It's like <laughs> I bet he is. <laughs> yeah. I saw footage of him recently. He looks he looks like the years have not treated him well. Like he <laughs> he's definitely like some of these guys look great at their age, you know, and some of them are like the party and definitely got to them. He's one of them where I like you see him now and you're like, wow, man, he's pretty bashed up. It's like, yeah, they had like really rough lifestyles for sure, which is something that is it kind of changing right now. Like, you know, it's like musicians right now, like take a lot of care of their health because I think that mm -hmm. they're aware that that's not going to last forever. And I think that's the thing that because we've seen our heroes go bad and watching your yeah. heroes go bad, bad is like that's the best thing that can happen so you don't go bad but it's sure. like right and um i truly believe that discipline right now is taking over it's like the more disciplined people are the, the more they succeeding in in this industry that, it's, that's what i believe yeah i came up watching those pantera videos too right the vulgar videos and stuff and it's like those guys were just constantly drinking and like Motley Crue and all those bands. And it's like, I think with Pantera, obviously, you know, they Dime and Vinny kind of got taken out. Yeah. But like, that's the mentality I grew up with. It's like, oh, yeah, of course, like you're going to drink every show and be like smashed all the time. And it's like, it's hard to do that, <laughs> like to go from date to date, hangover and stuff like that. Like once you start really grinding. I know, I, and now that you mention it, actually, that's what I grew up with too. The decline of the Western Civilization Part Two, vulgar videos, and I thought that was great. I thought that was cool. Right now, I feel like life has given me like a second chance because I was a really undisciplined guy for sure, mm -hmm. and it was at the moment that actually kind of hit rock bottom, which is I actually have hit rock bottom more than once, <laughs> but lately it's like. I've realized that this is like a second chance and not everyone gets a second chance. So I'm taking it like, you know, taking it real seriously. I think the fact that I went on tour when I was like 26 or something, and that was something new because here in, at least in my country, it's not that you get to tour as a metal musician or rock musician in a constant basis. It's like you play on a weekend, you get really, really drunk, repeat next week in <laughs> but when you're in like in an international touring schedule you can't do that at all you gotta be 100 percent. you gotta be healthy you gotta you know give a good good performance and that's something that um i think some musicians we get to learn that the hard way and and i'm glad like that some of us did on time yeah, I talk to bands now. I think it was Edge of Paradise I was talking to, and they're like, "Yeah, we work out like on the road and stuff, and like we're like eating good." And even I saw a thing, uh, and this was like in hip hop, but it was I think it was Chuck D from Public Enemy, and he was talking about how uh, this one rapper uh, who was it? Um, uh, I can't remember exactly. It was like an old school rapper, like Melly Mel or one of those guys. Um, but but Chuck D was like we'd all be going out and drinking and like eating fast food and homeboy had a personal chef cooking like baked salmon and like greens and stuff on tour. And he looks like he's like still 25, like today, like he looks fantastic. Like the rest of them are all aged, like insane, but this guy still looks like he's like 30. Cause he just consistently took care of himself. 
that that's pretty much uh, because of the people you're surrounded with too. For example, that happened with Saratoga, the lead vocalist, who is um, Tete Novoa, that's his name, and Estefario. The three of us, we would go to the gym every time that we could. We would train, we would try to eat like as healthy as possible. Of course, we would party, but not like in a hardcore way because we know yeah. we, we have to catch a plane tomorrow. We got to, you know, be on the road for eight hours or so. And the worst thing that you can do is being on the road with a really bad hangover on yourself or being on a plane after having like a lot of like bourbon and stuff. It's like, I don't think it's going to be a good idea. No. Yeah. Not unless you have a really good cleaning crew on the plane. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, I don't think that's like for everyone. <laughs> But yeah, man, I think that people are more aware that in the end, it's like people are paying money to watch a show. The worst thing they can do is watch like a shit show, right? And I think that people are realizing that. And now the internet has taken over. So if you are doing like a really, really bad scene on your show and you're like fucking up in every single note and, you know, falling apart on stage, everybody's going to watch that. Maybe even like more people are going to watch that video that, than, your, than your whole career which would be really, really sad. And I've watched it like, you know, when people get caught up doing playback and stuff like that, that's on the internet, that's on video and it's going to be there forever. Yeah. I literally just this morning was flipping through Instagram or TikTok and there were people uh, slagging, uh, I think it was Grimes did a DJ set at Coachella. And it was just like everyone, like to your point, it's like, I never would have cared about a Grimes DJ set, but because she did such a bad job, like everyone's like sharing video of it, like, look at what, look at how terrible this is, you know? Oh, that's so sad because that's the thing. It's not, it's not the people that are there. I, I remember there was this thing that people would think like when they were in a live show, they were, we're going to play super late. We're going to play a gig super late and we might be a little bit hammered, but nobody's going to tell because everybody in the audience is hammered too. Well, there's probably this guy with a cell phone and he's going to film the set. And it's like, he's going to tell everyone about, dude, this show sucked. Yeah. And that can be like, you know, a really, really bad line in like in your career timeline. Absolutely. I think it kind of, in some cases it kind of closes doors, which is sad. Yeah. And if you do that a couple of times, people ain't going to come see you anymore. You, you know, you lose your ability to tour really. Yeah, it's like maybe some people would think, dude, did you watch that shit show? I'm so glad I was there because I saw that. But it's 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 not that fun when that gets, you know, the daily routine that, you know, that's definitely not fun. So we got a few more minutes, man. What are you up to this year? Like what's what's next in the pipeline for you? I know you get you're going to be touring. Um, are you going to be up here in the States this year? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be touring with Saratoga. We're playing in in california we're playing in san francisco in santa ana and los angeles awesome and that's gonna be in june and also in july i'm touring with chris jericho and quarantine uh that's july that's like the first week of july we're gonna play in uh Jurgles. that's the name of the uh Jurgles. that's the name of the venue we're gonna play in detroit i i really can't wait to play in detroit and should be fun should be a cool tour it's like They're like short tours. Like the, the bass player once said, it's like prom night, short but sweet, something like that. <laughs> yeah, nowadays too, a lot of people have families and stuff. So it, it, it makes sense. Like some of these shorter tours, it's like you, you get you get out for a week or two and then get back to your kids or whatever. Absolutely. But yeah, and, and, and well, I have released this new music with uh, Dino Caceres. It's called Sigma and it's available everywhere. It's on my YouTube channel too. Uh, with a really awesome drummer called Eduardo Valdo. He plays for Red Devil Vortex. And okay. Yeah, man. So what's, the, what's it called again? Spell it out so people... S-I-G-M-A. Sigma. Sigma. Okay. Yeah, Sigma. And Greek, Greek alphabet, right? Yeah. And it's out there. And yeah, and it's really good because actually when we did this track with Dino, 
I would always tell him that I loved Descent by Fear Factory. Yeah. Right? And I loved Zero Signal too. So he kind of told me we should do like a mixture of those. And you should like, you know, make some melodies and shredding on it. And that's what we came out with. Good stuff. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'll definitely check that out. Awesome, Dustin. Awesome. I hope you like that. Yeah, well, man, I hope I get to catch you live. Thank you so much for taking the time to come through and, and chat with me today. And please come back and talk with me again when you have some, some new news or Absolutely, Dustin. Thank you very much for having me here. I've I've, I've been really you know, excited to talk to you and I'm really excited to, uh, to read those comments from your community. So thanks a lot for having me. Awesome, man. Very, very much appreciate it. And, uh, everybody check out, uh, Saratoga Sigma and quarantine. It's with a K, right? Yeah. Quarantine with a K. All right, man. Thanks again, Charlie. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dustin. Rock on buddy. We'll see you soon. Absolutely. Take care, brother. Take care too, man. We're out. Keep it brutal. Hey, thanks.